These teeny tiny fish are Bosmania rainbow babies. From Bob Steenfotz, Gary Lang, a Tinjo Bosmani. Let's talk about how I got some and how you can raise yours. Hello everyone, this is Bentley, and for today's video, if you'll recall, Tank of the Week, uh, a couple weeks ago, but real recently, I talked about how Bob's Rainbows finally gave me eggs. Well, today we're going to go through the process of picking eggs from a mop for rainbows, and what to do all the way up to like the initial probably first two weeks. Uh, I have a kind of older video about this, but I'd rather do something a little more updated with some better gear, and better shots, to make sure you guys can see exactly what's going on and exactly how to go from, I've got a pair of adult rainbows, I've got eggs in a spawning mop, what do I do now? All the way to, now they're ready for live baby brine shrimp, and in theory, should be at their hardiest from there on. So with that being said, let's get over toward the tank, get our mop out, and start picking some eggs. Here you can see the previous hatch of eggs swimming around in this little ring. This is the same thing we're going to use on the new batch that we're about to pick. You can see how tiny they are. These guys range up to a week, and you will every once in a while see some that just aren't going to make it. They have improperly formed swim bladders at this size or some other defect. So if you see guys that are like scooting around on the very bottom, they're probably not going to make it all the way. You are going to have losses with rainbows. This is something you've got to get used to uh, for every, let's say, 50 eggs. You might only get 35 to 40 hatch because uh, eggs will fungus. They take a long time, so it can go slow. And then out of those, you might only get 25 or so that are actually going to make it past the first week. Don't let this deter you. Just keep this in mind. They spawn every day. You can get a lot of eggs out of them. You're going to lose a few. Just keep working on the ones you have alive. Okay, guys. So here we are. I'm going to pull our mop. I'm going to push my light back just a touch here. We've got it just getting a little extra light and warmth to the babies that are beside. So we've got this spring off camera here, kind of, you can just barely see it right here by my hand. That's full of babies. We're going to work with this ring here. You don't necessarily have to have a ring like this. There's lots of other options. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's go over kind of how you just pick eggs and what to look for. Now the big thing is, when you've got a rainbow mop like this, right? It's going to be really wet the second you pull it out of the water and your plants might be attached to it. You can at the bottom because if you're very gentle, very little pressure, just barely compress, push a little bit of water out of it. And this shouldn't hurt the eggs. Okay. You have to be very gentle. Now, if we look at the very top here, you see right here by my thumbnail, there's our first egg. So some of these are up at the very top of the mop. All you need to do, right, make sure that's in frame. There we go. I'm just going to ever so gently touch it. You want to just barely feel it touching your skin and pull it off. They're not very sticky. You can actually see it right there on the tip of my finger. This is all about gentle touch. When you get your first ones and then you just basically touch it to the water, it should come right off. If it doesn't, you can lightly roll your fingers like this in the water. Be very gentle. Don't apply pressure to the egg. Um, they're tougher than you think, but you don't want to like manhandle these things. All right, so we've got a couple more eggs here. Again, just very gently, like this egg right here. Just barely, barely getting pressure on it to touch it. It's actually in a bunch of the yarn. But that's fine. If a little bit of yarn comes off with it, pull the egg off down in the water. Okay? So that's all we're going to do for picking our eggs. Now I'm not going to bore you and pick every single egg on camera. But just get used to it. It's going to be one of those things where you'll eventually get to the point of where you can just see an egg, reach in, grab it. And sometimes you can barely touch them with your fingers wet and they'll come right off. And then dip it down into the water and you're good. So, you know, if I'm picking it at speed, you just see, this is me just grabbing eggs very quickly. Sometimes the hardest part is getting them off. 
Now I want to try and get you to see one thing here. You can see there's a lot of eggs right here, right? You see how these ones are a little bit more cloudy white, this one right by my finger, compared to this one here, which is a little more clear by my other thumb. Cloudy ones are already going to be something that either isn't fertilized or is starting to fungus. We're just going to take those and get rid of them. Those are not going to be good, viable eggs, so you don't want to keep those. So I'm going to go ahead and pick the rest of these eggs, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about uh, the important parts about setting up your hatchery. Okay, so we've got our eggs out of our mop. We've got our two side by side here. I really want you to pay attention to the amount of flow that is going on in these rings. It's really important that you have a pretty minimal amount of water flow and disturbance to the top side of the water. Rainbows for the first, say, month or so of their life will typically live in the first quarter to half inch of water of whatever water system they're living in. And because they're so tiny and so fragile, if the water is moving too much, it can disturb them, cause a swim bladder issue, cause them to sink, or cause them to be unable to swim, and then they effectively will drown because they're not moving enough to get oxygen. You'll notice the one on the left that already has babies. and See how minimal that flow is compared to the second one that's on the right. Both of these are fine. That's a pretty minimal disturbance, but if you can get closer to the amount of movement on the first one here, use my finger to point, that is going to be better. It's very, very minimal. So if you're using a small container like this, um, you're going to go for about what you're seeing here. If you're using something different, which we'll talk about those in a second, just keep that in mind. Very minimal water movement at the top, but you still need oxygenation. Keep that in mind. Let's move into hatching and going forward. All right, so here we are looking at the hatchery that we just picked eggs for, and you can see there's a little bit of the yarn left over from the spawning mop, but you can also see that mass of eggs right there on the bottom. Quite a few, but keep in mind, we're gonna lose some of these. What's next? This is the hard part. Unfortunately, this is where patience comes in. For rainbow fish, their eggs take anywhere between seven and 14 days to hatch. Let's say that you had 30 eggs laid today and you picked all those 30 eggs and you put them in there, each individual egg could hatch on a different day. It's not that, oh, this batch will take seven days. No, you could have five eggs in here hatch in seven days. Most of the rest of them hatch within 10, and then one or two stragglers hatch at that 14, and even potentially sometimes up to 20 days. This is the <laughs> really wonky part about rainbow fish. So you will want water movement of some form in order to prevent fungusing. So again, you saw earlier, we have a little bit of movement going on that just cycles fresh water. Now, if you're keeping them in an established tank, like I am in a ring setup like this, uh, it's just about gauging that and making sure that their water is warm, and that you keep your regular water changes going, and that you just let that flow go through and keep that water, most importantly, oxygenated. Now, if you want to put them in a different container, there's a lot of options, and we'll talk about that toward the end of this video. But just keep in mind, whatever your hatchery is, make sure that there's a little bit of water flow going on so that the eggs don't fungus. In the case that you have something completely contained to itself, like its own, let's say you're using a specimen container, and you're hanging that inside the parent's tank to keep temperature, and you're going to water change this regularly you've got one airline that goes down into it. You could use something like methylene blue to prevent fungus. And then as soon as you start getting babies, um, very carefully transferring those babies out of that container into a different container. Now this is a lot harder um, and you can realistically like only have a single drop of methylene blue in a small uh, specimen container. And I'll put a link down below for those that you can get them on Amazon, what I'm talking about here. Like Master Breeder Dean, for example, does this. And then you don't necessarily have to change water. You just have to keep aerated until they hatch. And then as soon as they start hatching, you start changing your water to get the methylene blue out and to get fresh water. And then from there, if you can carefully move them, do so. But they're very, very fragile, and that can be very difficult. Um, I've seen some people use like a teaspoon 
uh, or you know some kind of like soup spoon to very carefully move fry one by one in small amounts of water to their next stage. I personally don't like this. Uh, if you're having lots of trouble with fungus, this is a, a good route to go. I've also heard that you can do this with ICX. So I'm going to be doing some experiments here very soon. Uh, my, I need to get a new specimen container because the one that I wanted to use has a crack in it that won't hold water. Uh, and I'm going to test this using ICX because if you can do it with ICX, that's far safer than methylene blue. And uh, we'll have a really good solution. And I'll make a video if we can. So we've got this. Your rainbows start hatching. What now? So we've got our rainbows. They've started hatching. Kind of like we have on this rain. We've got these teeny tiny pencil streaks for babies. Well, how the heck do we feed these things? There's a couple different options. Uh, number one, if you can, is to use very fine microfoods like vinegar eels, microworms. I think vinegar eels are slightly better. Or if you can, cultivate paramecium and infusoria and use those. Those are probably the best sources. You won't be able to use something like uh, baby brine shrimp until they're about two weeks old. But one of the easier options if you don't want to cultivate live food is using a powdered food. So my personal favorite is ceramicron as a powdered food. See if I can get this thing to focus correctly. There we go. Now, you got this big thing. You need a teeny, teeny, tiny amount of food. And I stole this technique from Master Breeder Dean. So what we're going to do is take a very standard, super cheap paintbrush. This is a size zero round. It's like a 50 cent paintbrush you could get at any given craft store. But all I'm going to do is barely take it inside and tap the top. And all I'm looking for, do you see the difference in color there? Let me get it into kind of focus here. How little is on this? It's not a lot. You really want a very, very fine dusting. And then all you're going to do is take it over the top and just tap it. That's going to put a very tiny amount of food in there. I'm tapping twice just because i got a lot of babies in this thing right now. And that puts a ton of very fine micro food into your system. And there's still going to be some left over, like you can see it here. Don't worry about that. You just want very, very little. You don't want too much to accumulate inside of whatever you are using to keep these babies. You want just enough so that they can eat and realistically, you need to be able to feed these guys at least twice a day, preferably three to five times a day. This is where live foods really help. You can do something like vinegar eels. You can harvest a bunch of them, put them in the water, and they'll keep floating, and the fish can just keep eating on them as they need. But if you don't want to cultivate live foods, you're going to have to stick to a powdered food like this, and this is really going to be one of those things where it's like feed before you go to work, feed as soon as you come home, and then feed one more time before you go to sleep. Um, you know, give them a couple hours between feedings, but make sure they have very tiny amounts of food as often as possible, and that will help increase your survival rate. We're gonna feed like this for about two weeks. After two weeks, your rainbow fish babies should be big enough to where you can start feeding them live baby brine shrimp. And if you're saying to yourself, well, Bentley, what if I don't wanna do live baby brine shrimp? Don't raise rainbow fish. Um, I, I hate to sound really like cruel about it, but I'm serious. Like you'll really want live baby brine. So let's go ahead and kick back to my face and we'll talk about the last parts you need to know in order to get your rainbow fish going. Let's talk about the last few things you need to know for raising rainbow fish. So we've, we've picked eggs out of our mop. We've got them in a hatchery. We're going to talk about hatcheries in just a second. Uh, we've got our fish to hatch. We understand how to feed them for the first few weeks and then that mean Bentley guy told me that if I want to do rainbows, I have to do live baby brine. How long does it take to raise rainbows until they get to an inch, two inches, three inches? Here's the hard part. Rainbows take a long time to grow. More importantly, every rainbow species is slightly different. Those Bolzmanai that are over there, for example, um, they're going to probably take six months to get to between two, one and a half and two inches. And at nine months, we'll probably start seeing definitive color to where we can sex them, male versus female. And there's also body shape stuff and fins, but we'll, we'll just say color. We should have enough color to be able to determine this as long as we are keeping them correctly. 
So what does that mean? That means giving them live baby brine pretty much daily. Uh, and sometimes multiple times a day if you really want to do this right. Uh, good temperature, a little bit of TDS in the water, and more importantly, room to swim. So this all sounds really complicated, I know, and now you can understand why I'm like, yeah, it's hard raising rainbows. But let's backtrack. I talked about a hatchery. You saw that I'm using these crazy ring things. Uh, those came from Swiss tropicals. They're, they're called the German breeding ring. Um, I've, I've explained before, I don't actually really suggest them. And that's because they kind of take a really technical feel to know exactly how much food you can feed so that you don't scum up the bottom screen. Because if you scum that screen up, uh, it can cause all sorts of problems as far as uh, room for fungus to grow and all sorts of nasty stuff that can cause to a lot of deaths in your rainbow fish. Uh, I would actually use something like the marina hang on back or hang on the tank breeder boxes or a dedicated somewhere between a five and 10 gallon tank. I technically prefer a 10 gallon. Uh, if you can, of course, we would use Master Breeder Dean's fry system uh, and, and use those to raise and hatch our fry. And then once the fry start getting big enough, uh, somewhere at say a month in the fry system, we would then move them to their own dedicated tank, somewhere between a 10 and a 20 long. You could do a 20 tall too. Those are fine. 15 gallon is fine if you want to do some weird stuff because you're Randy Reed. I know you're there, Randy. I know you're watching. The, the importance here is give them at least some decent room to swim. Now, you've seen I don't have, like, huge tanks for all my fish that are growing up. And they're, like, a year old. And they're all getting that, like, two and a half to three inches in size. You can do this, but it will slow the rate at which your rainbows color up and grow. It, it shouldn't stunt their growth. Keep this in mind. I know people might worry about stunted growth in their fish. It shouldn't do that. But what it will do is slow the rate at which they're going to grow. So that being said, we've, we've got our hatchery. Um, I technically would suggest like if you have 10 gallons and you have a 10 gallon until they hit say six months, once they get to about an inch, inch and a half for all your babies. And then if you have something like a, um, a 29 is fine, but it's more like if you have a 40 breeder or a 55 gallon, something like that where it's good room, doesn't necessarily have to be super tall, but lots of left to right swimming room that is where I would use as my final rod. So let's say you were doing what I'm doing. You've got two different rings full of babies. You're probably going to have a third, maybe even a fourth. They all get to about a month old. You're going to transfer them to a 10-gallon tank and let them raise up to about an inch, inch and a half from there. That's probably going to take you six months total from hatch to that point. Then you could have a singular 40 breeder would be really great. Uh, if you have anything bigger, of course, this is phenomenal, 75 gallons, all that kind of stuff. But let's just go with a 40 breeder. Pretty commonly available. Uh, maybe you have a 30 breeder, just because it's the 40 breeder is a little harder to get. You have a tank that's just not quite as tall or something like that. This is all fine. It's got good swimming room. That's the big thing. You can, in theory, do this in a 20 long as well. But if you have any reasonable numbers, you really just want the bigger water system. From here, you want to graduate away from a sponge filter. And uh, once you move them, so like you move them to that 10 gallon, now you can have your sponge probably pumping after about a month at pretty much full movement and your rainbows are going to be okay. If you want to dial it to like 75% to play it really safe for another month and then after that go to full power, this is also perfectly fine. But a sponge filter is great. Uh, Matten filters, of course, are good. Any of your air-driven filters, uh, even like a Zis filter if you're using a taller tank, maybe you're using 20 talls, this is all fine. When you get to that 40 breeder, Get something that's got a little more flow to it, whether that's a hang on back, like a, maybe an Aqua Clear 75 or the Tidal 75, a small canister filter. Maybe you got a sump because you're really, really cool. Uh, you know, any of these things that have a little bit more flow and a lot more bio capacity. This is what you're going to want to do in that grow out tank because this is where you can take three or four tens worth of baby fish and put them all there and let them grow out a little bit faster. That extra space for those rainbows to move is going to help them grow quicker. So you can get them to like three inches and fully colored up in nine months instead of a year. Uh, now again, each rainbow is slightly different. Bozeman and I are a little slower than some of the other species, but typically expect that your rainbows will take anywhere between nine months to a year to where they're going to be a reasonable, sellable size fish. This is part of why not a lot of people raise rainbow fish it's not the greatest fish for profit kind of thing. It's something you do out of love. But if you love rainbow fish, 
this process where they go from this teeny tiny little pencil streak till they start to look like a fish. Then you can see like, oh man, at a month, it's got a real rainbow fish body shape. And then at you know two months, oh, it's it's starting to get big enough to where you can you can really see that body no problem, and you can start seeing the fins come in. And at three months, that's probably like an inch long. Oh man, it's a little teeny tiny baby rainbow. I mean, I wonder when I'm gonna start seeing color. Now, if you're really good and you've been feeding baby brine shrimp twice a day since they were two weeks, after about two months, you can start seeing early color in your fish. Now that kind of requires black background black substrate, and typically the sidewalls of your tank black too, where you've only got a single viewing pane, that darker set is going to increase coloration in your fish. So what are some, some big no-nos in your hatchery? Because this is the most key part. That first month is the hardest part about rainbow fish. From there on out, it's just about patience. Number one, make sure you don't have too much flow until those rainbows get old enough. Number two, make sure absolutely make sure no snails. You do not want snails if you're going to have eggs in these tanks. The snails will eat them. Now if it's a setup similar to mine where the adult tank has snails and the babies are isolated in their own hatchery outside of something, they, you know, if you're not putting them directly into a 10 gallon, that's fine. Just make sure that that can keep those snails out. So like the marina hang on the side breeder boxes are pretty perfect for this. If you have spare cherry shrimp or any kind of neocaridina, cherries are probably the best example, it's perfectly okay to have a bunch of cherry shrimp in with your eggs. They will not eat eggs, at least in my experience. They will help prevent fungus on eggs, which is pretty crucial. You do not have to pick eggs off of a mop. If you're using a 10 gallon tank as your hatchery, just take the mop full of eggs, move it into the 10 gallon tank, and let the fish hatch out of the mop. And once you've gotten to where it's, say, a month after they've they've hatched, pull the mop out and move it. Now, you can move it earlier, but you really want to make sure you've gotten every egg out of there. I just say a month because it's a very, very safe window of time. Once you've got them to, like, a, a larger grow out, you're pretty much set in the clear. The big thing is to make sure that you're just giving them good sources of food and room to run. Now what's really cool about rainbows is they will start spawning as early as six months. So if you're watching and you're seeing early spawning behavior, throw a mop in there. You'll start getting tons of eggs from all those babies in there. And as long as you can pull a mop out and see that they haven't eaten every egg in the mop, that just speeds up your cycle. Now you've got an entire colony that can breed on top of your breeding group to begin with. So now you're going to get more and more babies um, I've seen people who have like turquoise rainbow fish do this very, very successfully. Some Bozeman I do this very successfully. Um, there are some that are not very successful that are really good at picking at your mops. Um, but just keep in mind that this is something you can do. One of the best species for this that uh, Master Breeder Dean does all the time are Praycox rainbows. He will colony breed a bunch of Praycox rainbows. And then as soon as he sees the first fry at the top of the water, anywhere near the mop, he'll pull the entire mop and move it to his hatchery and let them grow from there instead of picking the mop out ahead of time because he just knows it's going to be laden with lots of eggs and he's going to get lots of fry. I personally don't do this method, but that is just because I do bigger fish and I spend a little bit more time uh, at work, so I don't necessarily get an opportunity to see those fry before they would get gulped down by, like, Bozeman Eye or something like that. So I have to play it slightly more cautious. The Praycox are a little nicer about that. That's basically it. I mean, rainbows are both very simple in the way the steps are, and yet at the same time very complex because they can be very fragile, and it does take a lot of patience to grow rainbows out. But that is all you need to know. I would love to know down in the comments, guys, tell me questions. Uh, which method would you use? What are you going to use as your hatchery? Do you want to just move the entire mop? Are you going to pick eggs? Like Bentley, I don't have time to pick eggs. That's just crazy talk. Or I'm worried I'm going to break them. I'll just move the mop. Whatever that reason may be. Or maybe you want that kind of peaceful every few days just picking eggs. I mean, it doesn't take me very long to pick through a mop of eggs. I think for that mop that I picked today, it took me 15 minutes. But... I make sure when I'm going to force breeding that I have that 15 minutes at least once a weekend to sit and pick eggs. And it's kind of like my time enjoying my fish for a little bit. I'll kind of space and look around at other tanks between picking eggs and stuff like that. It just lets me relax. 
Uh, but let me know, what, what would you be interested in? What would you use as your setup? Or maybe more importantly, what rainbow fish would you breed? I would love to know that down in the comments. If you like this video, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how to breed and raise rainbow fish, give me a like. If you have no interest in learning about how to raise rainbow fish, uh, you think that they are not that very fun, or you don't want to waste that much time raising one dumb fish, go ahead and hit the thumbs down button twice. Just let me know. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in getting a tutorial on how to make a spawning mop, tell me in the comments. And stay awesome. This is just a little extra footage for the post credits roll for you guys to see these teeny, teeny, tiny baby rainbows that came out of Bob Steen Fots Blows Monai. It's kind of crazy to see them like this, right? They're just little teeny, tiny pencil streaks. And yet, super, super cool. I would say there's probably about 25 so far. There's still a few more eggs to hatch. I have lost a few, but that's really normal. Just thought I'd let you see this while the end cards show up. And we can check out how these fish go in the future.